I think we often forget about the small town. But these places have incredible people and stories and histories as well. I wanted to document these places, help them tell their stories. To do this, I traveled to a nearby town of a thousand people in central Alaska known as Salsha. Enjoy these interviews, these memories, these stories from Salsha. When, when uh, Dick was 22 years old, and I was, uh, I was 18, yeah. and we sat down talking about things you'd like to do in life. One of the <laughs> things was sail around the world that yep. he mentioned. Yeah. He, he got hurt. We were building a two-story log house, our retirement home upriver. He said, you know, if we're going to sail around the world, we better get busy and do it because, uh, you know, this is not good. We're falling apart. <laughs> So we uh, bought a sailboat. We went looking and we found a sailboat in Gig Harbor, Washington and bought the sailboat. Then we decided, okay, we, we couldn't uh, get insurance on it until we took sailing lessons because we'd never sailed before. I know that's getting the cart before the horse, but you know we've never done things the orthodox way. We always just kind of do it our way, which isn't always right, but it works out. So we took sailing lessons, a one week live aboard sailing school. And then we took our boat out in the San Juan Islands in Puget Sound to learn how to use it and sail it. Then we left it, because by then we're at, in the middle of winter. We left it for the winter down there, came home, thought about how we were gonna sail around the world. And it was relatively easy for us because we've always lived out alone. So we were used to being alone together and we knew about navigation from our flying and all this. So we uh, went back down in May after having bought the boat that last fall. We went down in May and we, we sailed the boat to Alaska. Now that was quite an ordeal, but it was fun. It was exciting. We learned a lot. We got ready and we left in 1997 and sailed around the world for five years. Now we weren't gone from home that whole time. We flew home twice during that five years. We came home for two months when we sold the 170 airplane. Um, and then we came home in the year 2000 because our oldest son was retiring out of the Navy and we wanted to come to his retirement thing. And we were back here in Salcha for a short time then. And each time we came home, we worked on the house a little bit more, adding electrical and doing things to it and what have you. We came home in, nine, in 2002 after our five years of sailing around the world, which was a fabulous experience. We started out, of course, from Haines, Alaska. That was the closest port to here. It was 611 miles from Salcha to the port in Haines. And uh, we got our boat ready to go and we, set out from there um, the journey didn't start out so well you have to cross part of the Gulf of Alaska to get down and I had never been in a big storm my husband is an ex Navy man and he'd sailed on big boats out I mean huge boats yeah, not a little good. 30 our boat was a 36 and a half foot sailboat not very I mean our house uh, is actually got more room right through this room right here than their sailboat had on it. And we lived on that for five years. If you took half of this room, that would have been, you know, the inside of our sailboat. But we started out and we got down um, near the end of Southeast Alaska. The seas were atrocious. There was 25 foot waves with an eight foot chop on top. And when you're in this little boat, looks like a toy boat in a bathtub, and you've got these big waves. I was on my first night watch, and I have to admit, I bawled my eyes out because I thought, what am I doing? This was supposed to be a fun adventure. I'm out here getting knocked to pieces, and it was pouring rain, thunder and lightning, these huge waves, and when you look up and you see the top of your sail, the mast, the waves are breaking, are starting to break above the top of the mast, and we're like, oh but my gosh. the boat gosh. just goes up over. Yeah, well, he thinks everything's nice and easy. But I, I'm sitting there, and I, for three hours, on watch, all alone, out on the deck, and 
when I woke him up, he pokes his head out and he says, oh, look, isn't it beautiful? Look at all the foam and everything, and it's just gorgeous, and I wanted to smack him. And I said, it is not beautiful. I said, I'm scared to death. I don't even know what I'm doing out here. And on and on. This is not the cruise I thought we were taking and all this. Well, if he'd have been a smart man, he'd have left well enough alone, but he didn't. He said, honey, are you okay? I said, don't talk to me right now. And I went down and slammed the hatch. He opened it a little bit and he said, are you okay, honey? No, I'm not. Bam! And I... Luckily, he'd moved his hand. I mean, I would have probably crushed his fingers. I was so mad. And so then I go to, now you're supposed to lay down and go to sleep. After three hours of torture and terror. And so you're laying there and your, your eyeballs are just wide open. And you're like, I can't sleep. I got to sleep because I won't be awake for my next, next watch. That was my introduction into world cruising was a huge storm but he was real nice the next time he saw me when I came up on deck he he said well when we find a good port to pull into we'll pull in and you can rest and I'm like oh good that saved the day so we started out we went down the west coast of the United States Canada and the United States into Mexico we spent five and a half months in Mexico uh, playing literally up in the Sea of Cortez and island hopping and along the coast and while we were in Mexico, we took bus trips, uh, just local buses, not tours. Um, and we went inland, like we wound up in Guadalajara for its 456th birthday of the city of Guadalajara, Mexico. And then um, the next spring, we headed out across the Pacific Ocean. You have to go according to the weather. And so you wait till you're out of hurricane or typhoon season and this sort of thing. We headed across the South Pacific and hit um, the Marquesas Islands, the Tomotos Islands, uh, societies uh, like Tidhiti, Bora Bora, places like this. Places you hear about, you read about in National Geographic and, and you always think as a young person, oh, I'd love to see that someday. And here we were out there actually seeing these things. Um, we loved Polynesian people. The islands there were fabulous. We actually firewalked with the Polynesians at one of their religious ceremonies and things. We did uh, all kinds of different things that we wouldn't have had the opportunity had we have been in a big tour group. But when you sail into a small place on your own, they think you worked hard to get here and they treat you like your family. They take you home with them, they want to feed you, they want to share everything about their life and culture, and it was great. Some of our friends, quote unquote, they bet me I wouldn't do the firework walk. They weren't going to do it, but they were going to, they bet me that I wouldn't do it. And I did. And when I got off, I walked back and <laughs> said to her, you're not going to have a second chance in your life to do this. You better get out there and do it. <laughs> you've got to do it. He says, you've got to do it. This is a once in a lifetime chance, yeah. honey. But all I'm thinking is, oh, you know, I mean, I don't want to burn my feet. And this, this, I don't know what you call him. He was like, the, he wasn't the shaman. He was whatever they called him, yeah. the high priest of the group. And he said, do you believe? And I said, well, of course. And he said, well, then you won't have any problem. He said, just walk carefully, mm -hmm. uh, but don't hesitate. Keep walking. But don't hurry. Don't hurry, because if you rush, you'll fall down. Yeah. And you don't want to fall into the coals with your hands and everything. But walk carefully, and you'll make it. And the fire walk was about 20 feet long in this fire pit that had been burning all day all long, day. building yeah. up the coals and everything. And it was, it was really kind of interesting it was a cool experience but we did uh, Tonga Fiji New Caledonia American Samoa and we wound up in Australia and we spent a lot of time in Australia because that was one country we really wanted to spend time in while we were in Australia we bought a car an old Datsun station wagon 1983 and everybody said what are you gonna do with that old clunker and we said we're gonna drive around Australia in the outback and, and see some of the country we camped out of that and put a lot of miles, about 60,000 kilometers, driving around the outback of Australia with that. 
and we went over to New Zealand and um, through the, the Indian Ocean. If you've never seen an ocean, I mean salt water, that's just writhing with a bunch of snakes, it is exciting. You know, I looked over the edge of the boat and I said, what is that? It looks like snakes almost, but that can't be. I mean, we're, we're not in sight of land. What are they doing out here? And it was like thousands and thousands and thousands of these snakes. They're sea snakes. They're sea snakes. And the water they was really just are. all like <laughs> turbulent. Like, you know, you take your hands and go like this in a bath and the water would be all turbulent. And that's the way it was with a bunch of snakes. And that was in the Timor Sea between um, Australia and Indonesia. We wound up in Africa and uh, we did some safaris there, just photo taking type safaris. We weren't out to kill animals, although we did eat animal, any kind of animal that wherever we were, we ate. We've eaten, oh my gosh, everything from uh, camel to kangaroo to emu to uh, crocodile to uh, just all kinds. And we wound up in a Zulu village in South Africa, which was really cool. Although it was a surprise to see little Zulu young people running around with a cell phone. I didn't expect that. That surprised me. And there we ate, I just called it mystery meat because I have no idea what it was. So we just called it mystery meat. But the chief there invited us into his village and they shared a lot of their culture with us. And he and his wife asked us to have uh, supper with them. And you don't turn them down. You don't say no, thank you, because that's insulting. So you sit down to eat with them and you just hope you don't die before the meal's over. Because, I mean, they're not, uh, the way they cook things and fix things. And, and then they also made some, what do they call, Zulu beer? Yep. Which was gross. I don't even drink, but when they offer you something, you take it. And so you had to taste it, and it was terrible. It was like, looked like old dish water. So I take a second drink, just because nobody else did. He wanted, wanted to make the chief feel good. Yeah. That worked out okay. Yeah, and then I after, after we went around the, the <laughs> uh, Cape of uh, Africa, we went across the Atlantic towards um, uh, Brazil area and then moving up the the coast because with we they were having problems with the uh, fees and things and we didn't have a lot of money so we just kept moving instead of stopping at some of the places there and wound up in the Caribbean and we were there for about seven months island hopping around the Caribbean just enjoying ourselves uh, spent time in the uh, San Blas Islands with the uh, Acuna Indians, and that was uh, exciting. The ladies kept wanting to take his glasses because they needed glasses to see better for sewing, and so they kept wanting to take them off of his face and take his glasses and things like that. But we we had had a lot of fun with the people, in just eating their way and doing their things and. Then we came through the Panama Canal and back up the west coast towards uh, Washington, the state of Washington, where we sold the boat. We left the boat there for one year and sold it. So that's basically the way our sailing trip went. A lot of countries, I don't even remember how many right now, but I, I had kept track of the countries. A lot of different money. Dealing with the uh, visas and entry into each country you went to, uh, each island group or each country. It was um, a challenge sometimes because you didn't have a guide that said, well, you need this, 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 and this. You just showed up, checked in with customs and immigration and took care of what you had to do. But it was uh, an adventure that was more than worth doing. And I hope that, you know, I see more young people do this. That isn't something a lot of people do when we came back at that time, there was only about about 300 people from the Western United States that had ever sailed, sailed around, around the world. world. And uh, we chalked that off of our list. And after a year of being home, we realized we would probably not use the sailboat that much. We're not rich. 
And when you don't have a lot of money, you have to make your budget work the best you can. So we sold the sailboat. We couldn't afford to keep it any longer. We came home from our sailing adventure. We weren't even home two weeks and he had a heart attack. Mm -hmm. And that would not have been too cool out in the middle of the ocean. I mean, he would have died. As it was, he's still here, which is good. <laughs> Real good. Well, we're, I'm not a writer. We have written, I have, we've written a couple of books, but I'm really not a writer. Two books. I had my, our journals from cruising around the world, mm -hmm. and I put them together. My grandkids asked, uh, you know, they said, Grandma, can you put that into a book for us so we can have something to save about what you did? And I, I did, and then other friends here in Salcha said, oh, I'd like a copy. And it just went snowballed from there. And so we kept printing up more because it's a self-published book and it's not available anywhere except right here. Salcha store carries some, the Salcha Lodge has a few, and I have them and that's it. We're just about out of them. Yeah, we're, we're getting close to getting running close. out of books because I'm not going to print anymore. And, and the, then our one grandson said, Grandma, why don't you write down some of these stories about, you know, your flyings and your snow machine and your building. Now, you can't take 50 years of life and put it in a little thin book, but you take some stories and put in there, which the kids could enjoy and what have you. And so those were the two books. So when we came down here, we um, had already owned some property here and we bought the second lot and we made it one big place. And uh, we took off in our motor home and went south and traveled around. And you know, I don't care where you go, Salch is home. We had to come back here. Yep. Oh, well, of course we did. Because, <laughs> well, I mean, first of all, we had everything we owned here, but that wasn't the point. The point was, is that Salcha is home. Everybody here is so, I mean, we're not, we're not family blood-wise, but trust me, in Salcha, it's family. Everybody is each other's family because everybody is dislocated from a lot of their family. And so everybody treats each other like family. And this is what I love is that camaraderie, the companionship, the caring, and the willingness to help each other out doing things and um, we didn't find any place better 